So I just wanted to ask firstly if you could tell us briefly about how DC Cam came to exist. I know it's a long, complicated <laughs> story. Well, uh, let me it short. It it came to exist as a field office, research office of Yale University, yeah. supported by the U.S. State Department uh, and uh, a uh, U.S. Genocide Justice Act uh, passed by the Congress and signed to law by Bill Clinton in 1994 and how to exist. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. And you were involved from the very beginning. Yes, obviously. yes. The, the founding. Yeah. Uh, director. Yeah. Um, what is an, an aspect of DC Cam's work that you feel has been particularly beneficial for Cambodia's process of recovering from the Khmer Rouge era? I think that the uh, it's it becoming a public matter mm. that everyone have a sense of ownership of their particular history. And people talk about this publicly, and to me, it's uh, it's uh, it's it's a cultural debate that which is brand new to Cambodia, that people can can say things uh, without fear or intimidations, and also becoming a foundation of other matter that matter to them. You know that they are facing today, so I think that's very good for me because you know before it started that Khmer was a political uh, issues. It belonged to the states. Uh, it belonged to politicians. Uh, but yet we the one who's the people who suffer, uh, and you know it's 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 just like here nobody talks about this or so afraid to talk about this, but now you know even. Young people, the two ladies just came, they talk about this, and they talk about this. I would with hundreds of law students do a dissertation, their research, everybody. And that it's, I think that this is, that by doing this, you free them from the past horror. And then they determine their futures. And in the process itself, we, uh, we advocate such a tribunal, education, and other things, so that the people can take care of themselves. Yeah, yeah. Um, as an organization, DCCAM has known great success for outreach, for c campaigning for the establishment of the ECCC, uh, for having such a diverse range of projects. But if you uh, could describe um, uh, what would be the, the key aspect of DCCAM's success as an, as an organization, perhaps over other groups in Cambodia or in, in other parts of the world. Like which one? You mean like which project? Yeah, yeah. I would say documentation. To be honestly, it's documentation because it was our it was our strengths. It was something that no one can change or modify yeah. or eliminate. It's there, and that provides a solid foundation for us to define what happened. And why we are here now, and what we are going to do in the future. It's a documentation, and it was our the Prime's project and core, and we still continue to receive document even today. I think documentation also mean knowledge, mean information uh, that a lot of people don't value. It also it's significant, you know. Uh, for example, like this one, which is a a piece of music, mm -hmm. you know. It's a documentation. Yeah. You know, since like, I think documentation is the key. It could be when I speak, when I advocate thing, it's based on documentation. And I would not be afraid to say anything if I have documents in hand. Yeah. Uh, uh, when I say documentation, we also refer to the primary sources. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the DC camps uh, Ambition is to only collect things that have not been seen or used by others, or to conduct interview with someone who has never been spoken with others. Mm. So that's our ambition. So if I see things like exist at the archive, at those like museum, I don't go and collect from there. I look for something that's unknown, 
because to me, I want to bring something new to the society. Because already exists, there's no point. So, for example, I've listened from China, from there, mm. things like that. Yeah. And I think that is the powers of information. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, how have you found the, the technical skills or the, the people that you needed to help you do this work over the years? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, we met David Sheffer yesterday yes. and I have a friend, Mom Zani, he's Burmese. Uh -huh. Zani and I are the same age, but he's sort of Burmese, focused on uh, Horinga's issue. Mm. And it's very funny, uh, David Sheffer said to me, uh, we had breakfast together, oh, I met, uh, I met Yuk Chan of Burma. <laughs> <laughs> but this Yuk Chan of Cambodia is a bit more, uh, is more nicer. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, uh, I don't know, uh, what do I find? I, I, I open up for all, you know, I've opened, because I, I don't believe that I'm, on, I'm the only one or the only one who knows everything. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I seek help because I know, you know, I don't know. I'm not an anthropologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, you know, I'm not a geographer. So I open up to all aspects because I see the Khmer Rouge as a country and it has so many things and requires special skills. Uh, so, so I have to open up to professional uh, I think basically how I work with them is based on uh, perhaps uh, relationship, mm -hmm. you know, relationship. Mm -hmm. So that's what I saw that is that it, it's, that's really that's something that, that, is, that I have or I, I need to have to work with others. How do I work with the ambassador? Mm -hmm. How do I work with perpetrator? How do I work with the victim? How do I work with psychiatrist? How do I work with Korean? How do I work with Thai? Mm -hmm. And that is, I think that is, that is needed. And that's what I also train myself. For example, uh, I have to read a lot of books about Burma or Korea before I would go to Korea, things like that. So I have to understand those countries. So that is that every day I have to learn something. It's otherwise I can reach out to others. So that's something that perhaps uh, based on personality, I don't know. To be honest, I never thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think you do have a gift for finding the right people and, yeah, you and know, caring for them as well. Yeah, they stay with you. Yeah, I told my son, you should go away, but they stay too long. So <laughs> 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 I mean, I, I delay, uh, they were with me since they were 18, and now she's 30 something, mm -hmm. and maybe the kid is still around. Mm -hmm. But I think that uh, maybe that I don't have, maybe this is something that has been wrong. Uh, people think that I want something, but I don't. Because mm -hmm. the work is so big, but I really, I just enjoy doing this. Yeah. But other may to say that I want something else. So when people are with me and work with me, then they realize that I just I don't need anything. Mm -hmm. I like to give. I don't like to take away. Mm -hmm. So that's why they enjoy, perhaps they're looking in the right and they keep staying. Yeah, yeah. Something I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. <laughs> so um, obviously, DC Chem has been uh, extremely important to the work of the E Triple C. Yes. Um, we have heard um, over the course of our visit a bit about your experience mm. working with the ECCC, but I wondered if you could just, um, for, for people listening again, what has been the experience of working with the DC, ECCC over the past, um, what, ten 11 years. Uh, 10 years? Yeah, more than 10 years. What have been some of the challenges and successes of that? Well, you know, I support ECC wholeheartedly. Yes. Uh, on day one, we advocated, we supported, but I don't mean that I support it naively. You know, things can go wrong, yeah. can go to a different direction. I support it, but I also point out if we go to the wrong direction. For example, when I met David Sheffer yesterday, I briefed him. And I told him that uh, we always try to bring civil party to be part of our project in the field mm -hmm. so that their voice continue to be heard. Mm -hmm. And usually we uh, requested or we were informed by the civil party lawyer that we should invite 
the civil party where that we are working. Mm -hmm. For example, if I go to one of the provinces like Prevang, we should invite people from Prevang. So I did. Uh, so when, but and I start to observe, you know. Uh, so when you when you invite someone from the same village who are now civil party, and when you have program for everybody in the same village, and they both met. So I observe the two, but for me they are the same village. Mm -hmm. But one's a teacher, one a civil party. So when I observe, I told you, Shafa, I feel like very sad because the audience, not just only me, feel that the group who's, who closely associate with the tribunal it's more been, has been indoctrinated. They always say things that is not like, they no longer the person in the village mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. And people sort of wonder why that you became like that. Mm -hmm. And I told you, Shafa, I feel like they've been indoctrinated. They've been so tainted by the legal pressure from the ECC. For me, that's it's uh, it's it's this is harming than helping them. So you know uh, that's a challenge. So I do because I'm not working with the civil party, even though we assist them. But the lawyer, the one who sort of work with them and explain to them thing, but this is the result. So I told the Shaffer, I feel very uncomfortable. We also discuss about the uh, the case file. You know, we supply more than half a million, we supply anything. But sometimes the request is not necessary. It's not about the case file, but about the archive. For example, we have a lot of interviews we conducted decades ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also transcribed it, and we, sub we provide 100% transcript to the court. And we understand sometimes the defense challenge the transcript, and they want to hear the voice the people that we interview, right? Yeah. We have no problem, tell us the name, we give you the, the voice. Yeah. But when you don't have any reason, you want all voice right. of hundred and thousand names, mm -hmm. then it's not about the case file, but why do you need this? But the court always use legal justification, we need to hear everything. Mm -hmm. But can you hear because you're not Cambodian, you're from Germany? Can you hear all the Khmer languages? Mm -hmm. If you want to hear all the Khmer languages, you need what, 20 staff? Yeah. Half a million US dollars? Things like that? Yeah. Is it is it important? And that's a challenge too. So because I'm not uh, the person who I'm not the case manager, but the request sometimes you saw the question about why? Why you need the whole uh, cassette tape of hundred thousand of hours? Well, you need to hear ten. And yeah. just give us ten, then we give you ten. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Take ten minutes. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So that's a challenge too. Uh uh, other challenges, you know, uh, I think with the ECC, those are the two challenges, the Office of Court Investigating Judge mm -hmm. and the Victim Support Unit. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, that, uh, and I think that because of the, uh, the uh, perhaps it's because of the nature of the civil party, it's, uh, it's a civil law, it's not a common law. But mm -hmm. I, have, I have those challenges in dealing with the unit that seem to be implementing the civil law. Because I look at ECC as a genocide trial. Mm -hmm. uh, we lost two million life, but we have four or five million who have survived. Mm -hmm. And among those also are perpetrators to tell their story. Mm -hmm. If you want everyone to tell a story as a civil party, it takes 70 years. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So I think that's that perhaps it's those are the challenges that I have with those two units. And otherwise, I think that the court's working very hard. You know, the, the, the office of the co-prosecutors, the defend, the judges. We work with all units, we work with everybody there. The peoples, uh, the, those are, I think those are the two. If, if I have the power uh, in any negotiation for the future tribunal, mm -hmm. I would never recommend Two unit. One is office of court investigating judge, and second is victim support unit. Mm -hmm. I would, I would. I mean, the the, the civil law system, the civil party. I would not, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because I think that with this experience I have learned, mm -hmm. I have learned you. The purpose of a tribunal is to not only to provide a foundation, so that people can build upon, but also to free them. You know, from the past. Mm -hmm. from the past. Mm -hmm. You don't want to cage them with all this legality. Yeah.
that you have to say certain thing. You can say whatever you like. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. So just out of curiosity, what has what is the victim support program? I think maybe in other contexts, the ICTY called it an outreach program. It's different. Is, is a different, it's a different, different thing. thing. Has the ECCC had a, an outreach program? They do as have well? the public affair office. They do outreach with us. They, right. Their the office is fine. Outreach is fine. Right. Yeah. What kind of activities do they? Well, we started. Of? You know, we started from beginning, uh, and then we leave it to them to carry on. What we did from beginning, we bring people from. On the most remote area, and we busted them to the to the city, right. and meet with the international side and Cambodian sites and visit a few. Uh, our program is very thorough. For example, it's funded by Patrick Leahy Fund from the U.S. Right. Senator Patrick Leahy. Uh -huh. and the program was like we busted five people here, provide them orientation of the history of the court, speaking with. Mm -hmm. We want them to meet with the official like member of parliaments, mm -hmm. people who are involved with the draft in the Khmer Rouge law, mm -hmm. explain why the law come to exist. And then uh, they would also meet with international sites and Cambodian sites that they can ask questions directly. Mm -hmm. And then we also uh, warm them up by having them visit a few uh, killing sites and talk to others. We also work with psychiatrists to making sure, because among them, some were perpetrators, some were victims. Mm -hmm. making sure that they agree to sit in the same bus. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of pr proceeding. Then we have a, a performance on forgiveness, a drama, mm -hmm. for them to really try to understand between the court uh, and justice on the ground. So mm -hmm. we have a, a drama for them. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, so and the idea is to, they become the messenger for us to share with other mm -hmm. neighbors. So the numbers keep multiplying. 500, 1,000, 3,000, mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. Now go to like most close to a million. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. And then uh, then when the court start to pick it up and carry on, the outreach also expanded to other target group, like the court go to high school, mm -hmm. we go to teacher, we mm -hmm. go to the Islam groups. I mean, in Cambodia, everybody know the tribunal. Mm -hmm. The outreach was, I think the outreach was most success. Right. Everybody know. Yeah. Because everybody know, you empower them to decide the future of the court. Mm -hmm. And you know, people are saying people hate the court, people say people like the court. For me, that's a good sign. Because they have they have been empowered right. empowered and to determine whether they like it or not. And that is for me it's all about the process. Yeah. All yeah. about the so I focus on the process. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't I for me, if the court decide that Khmer Rouge is not guilty, I can guarantee you. The whole country will say they're guilty. So we already had the verdict. Mm, yes. So why bother? Yes. So we, we, but we must respect the rule of law. We must respect the court proceeding. So we, we sort of an educational for our public, for people yeah. to take this seriously. And it's the process itself that, that people can benefit. So yeah. I focus only on the process. Yeah. For me, without people's participation, the verdict is, not, is meaningless. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I focus on that. Because the court focus on the verdict, and why should I focus on the verdict when I'm not a court? So I find, I, I choose my battle. Yes. So I choose the process. Yeah, yeah. So there are a number of countries um, around different parts of the world, including work groups working on North Korean issues who are thinking about the future, and mm. uh, there is no court yet, there's no tribunal yet. Um, uh, you've already uh, shared with us a little bit about, um, you know, don't hand over your primary documents. <laughs> keep your keep your documents. I mean, what are some of the, what are like one or two of the the most important things that groups should be thinking about in the future when working with tribunals or international courts? Well, you know, um, I support the court, but the court won't be here the rest of their life. Uh, that's why the way we envision our work is not just only for justice but also for memory mm -hmm. because we also look at memory which we translate as education of genocide as a complementary of justice to the court. Mm -hmm. So we have defined our future beyond the court but we support the court at all costs. Mm -hmm. uh, for that reason you have to think about uh, what's in it for for your children, for your future, when the court is, is when the court is over? 
So one thing that come to our mind is that record, mm. that the archive that has to be here mm -hmm. for our children and many generations to come to learn. Learning, understanding also justice. Yeah. So I define that. Uh, so when it comes to documentation, I think that that uh, anything here belong to the state, belong to the people of Cambodia, and you have the nobles responsibility to protect it. Mm -hmm. And when you look at all of the international court proceeding uh, uh, and history, anything that you gave to them belong to the court. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and the court when they no longer here, they take away with it. I, I look at Bosnia, ICTY, Iraq, and I have learned. I have learned from international. Uh, experience that to define the local approach. So I also study whether that uh, when is the right time, when is really needed for the court to really have the original on case file mm -hmm. and why. Mm -hmm. So as long as you are sincere, provide all this uh, material with proper legal support like chain of custody, authentication, you sign, you testify. That should be sufficient. Mm -hmm. And secondly, it's that all the original are the treasure, the fragile. You pass on among all these many hands. Yes. You know, even when you go to the court, they don't need, they don't use it anyway. They photocopy. Yeah. You know, so would, uh, then which what kind of copy that would qualify the material for them to use to be acceptable by the defense team? So all of this, it's a study behind a piece of documentation. And I discovered that they don't need the original. Original belongs to the people of Cambodia. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you give to them, when I say the court, the court consists of what? 100 kind of people from around the world. Yeah. Each of them have bring in their own country expertise and understanding differently. Yeah. And that create the, uh, create the uh, irresponsible, create the uh, a room that thing can be uh, can be missing, uh, can be damaged, uh, can be disappear, or many things. And it happened. Yeah. I, it happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's why I never give any original. This is all original. It's on my desk. Mm. But if the court did it, we copy for them immediately. Yeah. In, in, in any minute, and I would sign and testify that it's fair. Nothing but the whole truth is from the original file. <laughs> you can have it now. You know? So, because. Because it not belong to me, it belongs to the 15 million Cambodian. Yeah. So that's that will come to the archive. I think that to understand that all the organization had to understand its own domestic archive law, international law, and also the how the court handles the evidence. It's a piece of knowledge and research that need to be done based on those local content. Yeah. So I never give them to any court. Uh, second question I forgot. Yeah, no, it was just just pieces of advice for for uh, documentation groups that are looking to the future. So obviously one is protecting your documents and yes, keeping them safe. Yes, it's one thing. And I think secondly also that you you have to know yourself that you're not a court of law, you're not a prosecutor. Mm. Mm. If you act as a prosecutor, if you try to determine which one is a piece of evidence, mm. then, then you don't lose your job. Yeah. You have to, you have to lead, you have to, you only can provide uh, preliminary information and understanding and determine what happened in the past, but you are in no position to determine which one is, is or is not a piece of evidence. If you try to do that, then you're not a court of law and you're actually contaminating information that you are collecting. Mm. You have to respect the court no matter what. And let the court act as it is. Yeah. But yet also you have to refine your position that you are not serving the court, you work with the court. Yes. You're not serving the court. Yeah. And that is important to the relationship between the civil society and organization. That's yeah. very important. Yeah, yeah. That's very, very helpful advice. As far as the uh, the verdicts uh, on the cases before the ECC have gone so far, um, what has been the, the national reception or the national opinion about the verdicts that have been reached so far? Has it been a satisfactory process for, for people? Well, you know, verdict, 
defined differently between the court and the people. Right. It's the same thing, the meaning of justice. Mm -hmm. uh, i give you one example. Uh, when the court started it, I think one leader was given amnesty by the king. And the king was around, the king was, had not yet passed away then. And people, even though the court said that, people don't believe that the court can function. The court won't be, won't have a fair trial because this person was given pardon by the king or amnesty by the king, so that it's a joke. So people, okay, the court exists, so people just move on. The day that this person got arrested, even a lady selling food on the market feel that justice being done. Mm. And she moved on. Mm. That's a verdict. Her verdict is the day a person that they never believed would be arrested. Mm. So when we arrested, it become a verdict for a lot of people in the country. Mm. So that's a verdict. Mm. Secondly, that, for example, when, I think in 2014, when the two, uh, when the verdict announced that the two will be in prison for a lifetime, uh, they move on. Yeah. They move on. So sometimes, you know, people have defined the meaning of verdict differently. Yeah. But then some people say, oh, we have to punish them more. But most of those are the small majority of a small group of people said, oh, well, you know, they, they, it won't, because of them, that's why I lost my sister. Then this is not enough. Kill them or chop them or hang them mm -hmm. or punish them severely. Mm -hmm. You know, there's always such a reaction, but I think that when you also uh, integrate in your work in terms of like sociologists, anthropologists, then they can understand whether why people say things like that. It's an out of frustration, yeah. anger, so you know, other other emotion, emotional reaction to it. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, when when there is a public announcement as such, that it's one of the most uh, that is the, you can feel that the power of verdict that reach out to all level, mm. and you can feel a sense of of satisfaction, and that means justice. When you feel more of satisfaction, that's justice. Uh, but then a uh, few years later, that the people heard that uh, there's another cases, but with the same person. Yeah. Uh, and that because. The, the court argued that uh, the punishment, the verdict for the crime that they commit against 12,000 people uh, is not sufficient unless they, they also punish them for the crime and get, uh, commit against 18,000 people. Mm. 6,000 different. Yeah. But for people, there's no different. Yeah. Because we lost 2 million lives. Yeah. It's not 6,000 different. But the court is strict to the, to the decree of the punishment, even though 6,000 lives, I mean, each life is significant, each, each life is important. Yes. But when it comes to number of differences between 12,000 to 18,000, for the people, it's confusing. Yes. But you think about 2 million. Yes. So for them, it, it they start to question the verdict. Hmm. Like, why so? What is the, what is the really the interest? Because the way people understand is different from the lawyer, a lawyer understanding. And then if you don't have proper communication between the court and the people, you create this. It's not happening here. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think that because also people have been so open uh, because of such a huge public debate. Mm -hmm. So I don't look at this as a negative thing. It's just like people see themselves also. Uh, People see themselves as, as a witness, as a judge, and as mm -hmm. a prosecutor, mm -hmm. and defend. It's interesting to see how they challenge the court of law. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's uh, I'm happy. I always take people's side because I'm happy when a villager argue with uh, with uh, a prosecutors or investigators. I'm very happy because I think that the court had to understand, uh, had to understand the, not just the crime, but who suffered by the crime. Yes. And for me, that's, that's extremely important. For me, that is the real court. When yeah. I see people that, you know, I told you a story a long time ago when we first met, I think, about an uh, international investigator went to look for a witness 
and they refused to ask anybody because it's, they want to keep this confidential. Yeah. And they went to a local shop. And this lady keep asking them, what are you looking for? I saw your car drive around for so many times. Mm. They say they can't tell because it's confidential. And finally, uh, finally, they're about to leave the restaurant and return to the court without, uh, without any information from the people they was looking for. They told the lady, the lady keep pressure the, the, the international investigating chat. So finally they, tell, they told her a name of the person. A first name, uh -huh. and it appeared to be her. Uh. <laughs> they were looking for. Uh. They said, "Why don't you tell me? I can't tell you anything." Uh. And you know what? They blamed the woman. Said that, "Why don't you tell us hmm. that you one of the witness?" He said, "Well, I live here a long time ago. Mm. Where were you?" Right. right. You know. So for me, that argument it inspired me. That 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 sometimes we from the international group from the books. From we, we are people who read book. Sometimes we we sort of uh, disconnect from the reality. Yes. And my job, DC camp is about the reality. Mm. So for me, I would side with her. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I I would do anything to support her because I think she was right. Yeah. And uh, and it's just like. This is one of the examples. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, she said, look, you know, I'm here since 79. I lost my husband, I lost my children. I was looking for you to bring this process of justice for a long time. I heard of it. I just want to support you. You tell me, I tell you everything. You, just, you tell me my name, I will tell you the whole day of what happened. Yeah. And you don't have to be a secret. In my village, there's no secret about the Khmer, about the killing field. Right. So for me, had the court have this kind of understanding, mm -hmm. they will bring more witnesses, mm -hmm. they will bring more evidence, mm -hmm. they will bring more support, mm -hmm. and they will have, have, they would have a better trial and can move faster. Mm -hmm. So for me, again, without people participation, the process is meaningless and just can, can, can drag longer, can cost more. Yes. You need people engagement. Yeah. And that is the job of the civil society. Yeah. Not to be a court, mm. but to be a woman, mm. the free the lady. Yeah. And you should look with the court as an equal yeah. partner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a very, very important advice, I think, for a civil society anywhere dealing with human rights abuses. And in in that area, um, one thing that I've noticed since visiting DC Cam and, and uh, the gallery is um, the different methods you have for, I guess, stress relief or <laughs> <laughs> balancing the very grim work yeah, of yeah. having to read and hear very difficult testimonies. What are some of the strategies that you use to balance out that, that the darkness? Yeah. Well, you, know, um, you need the beauty to understand the darkness. And as you can see, you know, I think you were I, I, I overheard your impression when you walk into my office, the glass door. Yes. You can see, I can see through all the way there. Yeah. And she can see all the way to the North Korean embassy in front of us. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I think it's transparent. Mm. Not just on the physical working environment, but mm -hmm. also funding, money, mm. process has to be transparent. Mm. Uh, and you create collectiveness among yourself. So when people know something, and they don't feel vulnerable, that people also know something they share. Mm -hmm. So it's, it minimizes the stress. You're not, you're not the only one who read all this testimony because you talk to people, you talk to colleagues, you turn around and people are just next to you, or you come to me. And uh, secondly, also, we always have staff meeting regularly every Friday. Mm -hmm. And every Friday, uh, people can talk about anything. Sometimes mm -hmm. talk about Aristotle or Socrates, they talk about the current situation in Cambodia. Mm -hmm talk about the rainy season, we talk about fish in the Tumbe River. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some snack together and we also, uh, uh, sometimes we see movie. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the priority of the film is about the Khmer Rouge, but sometimes it's about, you know, Zhang Ziyi, my favorite actress from China. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes yeah. Korean movies, sometimes, yeah. you know, so things like that. Yeah. I think because Evidence is lie. It's lie on every piece of things around you. Yeah. Evidence not just only a black at the crime scene, 
but everything can be a piece of beautiful painting, can be a a, con a conversation in a in a in a in a in a Disney uh, land movie. Huh. Everything can be in the on the logo of the uh, of the soap soda that you drink. Yeah. You know, everything can be a vegetable that you brought from the market, someone who sold you the vegetable. Yeah. So I trained my staff to look at circumstantial of evidence, not evident as evident. Mm -hmm. So anything can be evident. The environment, location, time, vegetable, food, painting, mm -hmm. watches, and anything. So those are in the film, those are in the performance, those are the gallery, those around you. Mm -hmm. And secondly, uh, this is a joke. We don't support starvation in Cambodia, mm -hmm. so we eat. <laughs> you yeah. know, we all have food and, yeah. and we eat. And we don't use donor money, donor money to buy food. Huh? Mm -hmm. We all of us write book and we sell book and we use the money mm -hmm. for our own entertainment. Right. So any of any one of my staff write book and publish it and we sell it. Mm -hmm. And we make quite a lot of money every quarterly. Sometimes mm -hmm. we make up to three thousand dollar mm -hmm. from selling our monograph, mm -hmm. magazine, uh, calendar, and we use that money for for food. Sometimes we travel to get every month to unknown place or mm. non-tourist place mm. to see temple, you know, to see the river, to the ocean. Yeah. So we, we, we support ourselves and we come together. And another thing is that all the staff here are required to learn and to go to school. Mm. As far as you have one master, some of them require to get two master or PhD. So knowledge also is important. If you have better knowledge, and the majority of your staff have good knowledge, it helps those who have less. Mm -hmm. And here, the majority of my staff get at least two, two masters and one PhD. Wow. So they here they help the other who's smaller. Like the two young ladies just came to me, she just graduated. Mm -hmm. But I won't feel worried that she would have stress because they started working with them, they've already been a PhD, they've been here around. Mm -hmm. So they help support the younger. Mm -hmm. So we support like, one to another mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in terms of knowledge, in terms of spirits, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. things like that. Yeah. So, and as you can see that uh, in this office there's no image of crime. Yes, yes. At all. Mm. At all. But instead, I made the office like a museum. It is like a museum. And we change every four months. If you come in the next six months from today, it would be a different painting on the wall. Right. Some of my staff hate contemporary painting. They, cannot, they don't understand. <laughs> but I told them, you train, you are trained to appreciate even as a piece of that painting. If you look at, when you look at a painting you don't like, try to find something you like, the color, the shape, the, uh, the image of it or something. It takes time to train Cambodian to appreciate contemporary. Mm -hmm. And you hear mostly contemporary because I think contemporary fit, just like fiction, is healing. Mm -hmm. If you have like a traditional, I think that is always tell you what it is. But with contemporary, it made you think. Yeah. It made you respond. It might be difficult in the first place, but when you train, then you, st you, you become very active, proactive, and you respond. And that's also a skill. Yeah. So I put all this, uh, I also mix with traditional. Because I know that some of them don't like contemporary, mm -hmm. but now they get used to it. And they only get used to it when they go to other people's office, they return home and say, oh, you know, the office that we visit, there's no painting at all. Mm. So they, so that thing, you know, it's something, a little small thing. Mm -hmm. And then my staff also appreciate the color. Yeah. But as you notice that at the office, everyone required to be a white shirt. I've noticed that. I was going to ask you about that, actually. What is I, that? Well, you know, like because that? also to aid, to aid uh, equality. Right, right. Because, you know, in terms of re finance, in terms of knowledge, in terms of many things. Mm. Uh, but on Friday, they can have free dress. Okay. On okay. Friday. Yeah. You know, because if I make more money than my staff, I would buy proper shoe, better shoe better brands, mm -hmm. you know, better jean. Mm -hmm. uh, but my staff who, who made less than me, who may buy like a sandal, the shoe is not so nice. Mm -hmm. But you know, people, and most of my staff are young people. Yeah. And being a young person, you want something that's good too for yourself. Yeah. But if people around you look better than you, then you feel a little bit of down. Yeah. So everyone might feel the same thing. Mm 
Yeah. <laughs> well, they, everyone looks very smart. And, yeah. And, uh, so, and also I think that it's sale uh, in terms of saving cost at home. Yes. They always buy like four white shirts a year. Right. And you don't have to worry about to get any fancy dress to come to work. You just wear the yeah. same shirt. It's easy. No stress. Just, <laughs> no. <laughs> just come. That's what Mark Zuckerberg, the Facebook founder, he wears the same grey shirt and jeans <laughs> every day. So I wear this all the time. Yeah, I, yeah. You know, I change a few things, but it's the same color. Yeah, yeah. And it's very convenient. Mm. But the staff also are trained to properly uh, greet visitors. It yes. doesn't matter who you are. Even mm. those... It's just a messenger, or people deliver a letter to the office. All staff are required to give them high respect. Mm. Because we look at them as someone who are either children or family of the survivor. Mm. We don't prejudice anybody. And for the international people, they are trained to look at, to, to look at them as they also humanity, immunity, and genocide. There's not again anyone in the genocide, uh, does not discriminate, they kill everybody. So when we look at our visitor, we also look at them as part of the humanity. So we have to, so I think all these things, small training, but I think that uh, I told us that, that you earn respect more by doing that. Mm -hmm. I mean, nothing wrong just to greet people mm -hmm. properly and hey, because I will work for the survivor. Mm -hmm. If they're here, you have to, they are our boss. Yeah. I'm not your boss. The boss is people who are coming and look for information. People are coming who are looking for the loss of their loved one. They may be poor, they may be a farmer, but they are our boss. So show respect to them. Yeah. So those are sort of morality that, that we talk among ourselves. And here people don't use Facebook. Yeah. Don't use Twitter. Yeah. Uh, if they do, I scream. <laughs> <laughs> They don't use it. Yeah. So I always, every day, I send information to them about social media tech, that all things that's around their life. Mm. And sometimes we discuss social and peer pressure, so they're aware. Mm. So this is part of our staff meeting discussion. Mm. Mm. Yeah, some, some very good lessons there. Um, the last question I wanted to ask was about DC Chem's um, future and, and the long-term legacy, not just of the documentation, but of all the work you've done. And on the wall behind you is this amazing Zahid. blueprint of Zahid Hadid Architects' um, drawing of the Slup Rith yes. Institute. Yes. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that and what your hopes are for uh, it in the future? You know, um, uh, If you don't have a home, you don't have a family. You know, uh, and when I, when I refer to family, to those who have passed away, mm. they have no home. You know, we don't know where they are, but so that like you living with the death, but they also have people left behind their children, their aunt, their brother and sister. So I want to have a home where all the children that can can uh, you know I mean it's a renewal but you can you cannot renewal also require to understand the past so I want all these young people to know that this is their home this is their family it's not like a family so the idea of a slip institute is a place that people can call home mm -hmm. uh, but it's a school campus and it's the idea that that Renewal requiring understanding of the past on a daily basis, so you can move. Mm. So Slip Institute is a school campus that is designed for Cambodia, uh, high school mm. and university and everybody that can you belong to them. So that, uh, that, that this can, be, can never be forgotten. Mm. Uh, but it's not about living with the past. Mm -hmm. You know, we cannot escape the past. It's about about defining the future. Mm -hmm. And that's why I want the place to be beautiful. So I study museums around the world and I have discovered that all the museums is designed by men. Mm -hmm. uh, and I determined that in all museums always look at some some darkness, show things that are really horrible. Mm -hmm. And I think that I don't want my sister to be in such a place. Mm -hmm. She really have died horribly. 
a million have died terribly already. I don't want them to be remembered in such a place. Mm. I want them to be remembered in such a beautiful place. I want to go to a, a palace and remember thing of my sister. And all Cambodians should, should, should be like that. Mm -hmm. So it was looked to be very beautiful designed by a woman. And Zaha is the only woman in the world mm -hmm. that can do this. That's why the, the design is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Because I want people to go there and think of those who have died in a beautiful place. And that's an honor. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go to those lands and I didn't remember my sister. To see the blood to remember my sister, to see the skull to remember my sister. Mm -hmm. I think that we have suffered enough and that it's important to preserve, but it's not about remembering. So I define uh, the remembrance in a very different way and I want to challenge the new century to the world from a place designed by a woman. Can we remember those who have died in a beautiful place? Mm -hmm. Why do we have to go to a crime site to remember of those who have died mm -hmm. terribly in the past? Mm -hmm. So for me, I still open up for better for the other approach. But for now, when I look around the last century of how the museum run and function, it's all about the darkness. Mm -hmm. So I want to bring a different one, different aspect. And Zaha helped me to do this. Uh, we discussed this, and we want also to to present the woman's role. That's why the, the building is very feminine look, yeah. very feminine, and I use culture environment, because I think that 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 we also have to define our future rather than and and have to also uh, prepare our future. We have to believe in the future. Mm -hmm to be simply put, and that's why it had to be that way. Um, but I thought of this even from day one. The DC camp exists not based on a written policy, based on question I ask myself every day. What if no tribe do you know? What am I doing here? Mm. So, so how I build DC camp mm. on a daily basis. So I, I answer myself, if there's no court, then at least my staff have gone to school. Mm. The resource is there and they will carry on. What if no tribe, you know, uh, it must be a place that we can continue to talk about this. Yeah. Because crime never stop. What if tribe, you know, would stop at certain cases? What should I do? So I keep doing that. Yeah. That becoming my strategic planning at every three, four, five years. I do yeah. that every two, three, five years. So I have designed this strategy based on question. And when I ask question, I ask my staff. When the ECC started it, the UN approach just to be part of the, the UN, part of the court as an evidence a section. Yeah. So I talked to my staff. And I told my staff, no, I don't want it. And I explained why. Mm -hmm. Because it would be a short life for us. If we part of the UN, then what happened if this court is finished? Yeah. Yes, I will home. We don't yeah. have a home. Yeah. I should be continuing to rent the house. So I decide not to be part of the UN, to be an independent, but promise the UN that we, I will support the court wholeheartedly. Hmm. Imagine if we part of the court today, mm. what the city would be like? It's mm. nothing. Nothing yeah. would be left behind for our people. Yeah. So it's a lot of battle with the question and the answer. So I had to ask my staff. Because it was very exciting. If you be part of the UN, you get more high salary, you have a social status. But it's a short term, it's a short vision. Mm -hmm. So all of this I always discuss with my staff. So by talking to your staff all the time openly, you form, you develop a process of democracy. You listen mm -hmm. and you disagree, you explain. You know, two staff, I think two or three staff fail. We didn't finish school. Hmm. We're not all success. You know, we human. Yeah. We made mistake. Few staff didn't make it. Uh, uh, we have a few staff that didn't make didn't finish school properly. Uh, we made twenty nine mistake. I can't mistake that we made. I brought up. I wrote a paper about that actually. The mistake that we made. So sometimes you have to be reevaluate yourself and admit this is not a lesson. That is a mistake that you made. So when you start to accept it, 
I think the staff also inspire. Mm -hmm. But you can't avoid or having a few would fail. So we have staff who fail. Yeah. Who didn't see it. But when they return, they return stronger. They return like a big PhD, a big book. <laughs> uh, the one I just showed to the two ladies is a big book by one of my staff who are now a, a professor in the state. Right. And wrote a book about China-Vietnam relation. Mm. You know, it's a big book. But he, at first he had short sights. He didn't think that the court will ever be established. Mm. Despite. So I, I have staff who went to the field and returned with a question like, you know, people are now a shortage of food and they have land, land grabbing issue and we go to talk to them about the thing that we don't even know that when the court will be established. Hmm. So it got very difficult. Hmm. But when you create this kind of environment, they tell you. So you find a new strategy. So strategy must be flexible and keep modifying all the time. Hmm. David Schaeffer last night uh, looked at us as a gaming when we started that, mm. what for us is modification of strategy. Mm. And we will reach and we have reached our goal. Mm. So your staff may be small, may be a volunteer, mm -hmm. but their greatest source is your strength. Mm. So I have always uh, depend on them. You see the painting downstairs? Yes. There's an image of a kite flying. In our proverb, there's a saying that the kite cannot fly without the wind. Mm -hmm. And the kite is me, mm -hmm. and the wind is my staff. So I keep telling my staff, you are the wind, I'm the kite. Yes. If no wind, then the kite will fall down. Yeah. So all those little things that generate from their own culture, their own contact, I think the key to success is understanding your staff, understanding the contact, and uh, honest if you make mistake. Mm. So that's how I run uh, the DC camp. Mm. And so far, no problem. So far, so good. <laughs> so far, very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's what, how I run DC camp. Yeah. Well, that, that brings me to the end of my, my questions, but thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you for asking.